Oh. I started. <laughs> we have to turn off the... Hey, good morning, the Socialistic Project. <laughs> M.R.S. Pearson, Carol Greenstein. Hi, Joe Tuari. How do I pronounce that, Joe? Welcome everybody to Home Together on Thursday. We're going a little bit early this morning. Uh, we're still home together, but we have a great guest today. It is Melinda Gates, and this was the time that she could go. Can you get in here, Patrick, my co-anchor? Uh, the dog is taking Patrick's seat today. So we're gonna, uh, today the co-anchors are Patrick, my son, and the dog, Champ. So uh, we're gonna be talking with Melinda Gates and she's uh, obviously the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the founder of Pivotal Ventures, the author, best-selling author of The Moment of Lift, uh, which is a new book that she just wrote. And she also has a great op-ed in the Washington Post today, which is why we're gonna be talking to her about caregiving, its pivotal nature, how important it is to jumpstarting the economy it's so critical to your generation and also my generation. So, and she also has a speech to graduates. Yes, yeah, she just did a, uh, a commencement speech. I think a joint one with her husband on Friday last week. Uh -huh. And um, which was really, uh, I think great that they kind of stepped up and, and you know, wrote a speech and something for all the graduates to, to listen to or, or get to read. And, um, you know, they've been so active in the last few weeks, or I guess active always, I should say, yeah. um, with finding ways to step up, to help, to donate, to use resources, and um, I'm excited to talk to her. Yeah, they've spent almost close to $300 million wow. in the last two months uh, towards uh, COVID, and so we'll be talking a little bit about that, but I'm particularly interested in talking to her about why she thinks we need to have this new conversation around caregiving, this is something that uh, I've been focused on writing about, uh, thinking about, trying to get people interested in. Caregiving is just one of those issues that um, somehow we have not made it a big national conversation. We've not been able to get everybody excited and yet everybody seems to be involved with it. It's gonna impact your generation uh, tremendously because both people are out in the workforce who's going to care for children who's caring for aging parents that's why you said you had to move in with me because I'm an <laughs> aging parent and you had to be a caregiver yeah I mean I think it's a, uh, a tough subject for a lot of people to to swallow the idea of caregiving and uh, paid sick leave and I think that you know unfortunately but fortunately a, a crisis like this and something like corona is going to bring it to the uh, to the forefront and, and hopefully people will start to take that serious and, and obviously Melinda um, Gates is and she's writing about it and mm -hmm. I think that it's great to um, you know bring it up to the news and to, to the vast majority of people because a lot of people are going to be going through that exact thing for the next you know however long right. this Right, you hear somebody lasts. says I care for my grandmother who's 84 years old. Uh, millions of people just in the Alzheimer's space alone 17 million unpaid caregivers caring for people with Alzheimer's then you add in uh, special needs kids you add in Parkinson's MS ALS and then you add in children so it's hard to jumpstart the economy if you don't have childcare if schools aren't in session. So uh, it would also be I think really interesting to talk to her about the role technology can play uh, in this new space that perhaps wasn't available five, six, seven years ago. Uh, is Melinda Gates related to Bill Gates? Yes, she is his wife. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is doing such extraordinary work here in this country and around the globe. And oh, there she is, Oops. Melinda French Gates, requesting to come in. Okay, request granted. Request granted. We granted that entry to home together she is going to join us on home together so we are connected there she is hi <laughs> hi melinda how are we good to see you yeah glad nice. glad we could do this today hi patrick i don't think we've met before we, we haven't but uh i was just gonna introduce myself it's a it's a pleasure to meet you and to be able to talk with you uh this morning so thank you so much yeah 
So Melinda, I read your op-ed. I just was telling everybody your op-ed is in the Washington Post today. It's entitled How Rethinking Caregiving Could Play a Crucial Role in Restarting the Economy. So bravo to you uh, for writing this. And why do you think the conversation is now? Why should we be talking about this at this moment? Well, because as we start to think about slowly reopening the economy, we have to talk about this piece because caregiving is something that pretty much every employee does. And we can't safely reopen this economy if we don't talk about this piece of caregiving. And I would say the one good news is, you know, we've got this opportunity, this, this piece that we never want to seem to look at as a nation about the fact that, you know, a lot of this caregiving is done by women or the most vulnerable. Um, it's kind of been hidden, but right now it's exposed because people have got their older parents home, they've got their kids home. And so now that it's visible, we need to talk about it and we can do some things about it that will help us basically rebuild our economy and open safely and slowly. So what do you think that the government should do? You talk in the op-ed about to, to ensure a fast and inclusive recovery. Government, business leaders, and investors need to make caregiving one a priority. Lawmakers can start by expanding access to paid sick and family leave for the duration of this crisis, and then also to implement it full time. Right. So in terms of the government, in terms of policy solutions, with the first one of the first stimulus bills that they did that actually has addressed, the only one that's addressed caregiving, it was a start, but it's not enough. So I'll give you a couple of examples. It gave 10 days of sick leave. Well, if you are exposed to COVID by someone else, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So what are you gonna do the other four days? So 10 days it needs to go farther. It needs to last the entire time of this pandemic. It needs to cover more people like grocery store workers, which it did not cover. And then Congress needs to be talking about paid family medical leave for beyond this crisis, because we are literally the only, the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't have paid family medical leave. Wow. And that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And, and so the government has spent so much on, you know, a fortune on these PPP loans, the small business loans. Is this on top of that? Or is this, is this kind of mixing in the caregiving clause into those, uh, those loans that they've been giving out, the, pay, the paycheck protection? Yeah, it's not, even, it's not even mixing the two. It's taking the next stimulus bill and just putting this directly into it. You don't even have to tie it up in the loans. You just have to say, this is what is right for caregiving. This is what's right for families because most of our families, most of our families who are employed also do caregiving and we need to protect them. A perfect example is our nurses. 85% of nurses are women. And yet women are talking a lot about how they're part of the sandwich generation. They've got older parents and they're caring for them now and they're caring for these young kids. It's an impossible task. Right. So, Melinda, I think, you know, you're, you're highlighting an issue uh, that's very near and dear uh, to my heart, right? And we've been talking, obviously, about healthcare workers and nurses and doctors, and a lot of the attention has been on that. And then there's this whole other population of home health care workers that really kind of hasn't gotten a lot of attention, the unpaid caregiver. Why do you think, and I have found it really difficult to get people's attention to this issue, I don't know if it's the language we're using around it, or is it because it's primarily impacting women? What do you think is the reason that the nation has not wanted to look at caregiving? And, and number two, why do when we talk about reopening the country, we don't, we say, let's start the businesses, but there's no daycare for the people who go to work to send their children and the schools aren't open. So is it really possible to open businesses without daycare? It's because as a country, we got stuck in this old narrative of, you know, the generation in the 1950s and 1960s where dad takes his briefcase and goes off to work and mom stays home and cares for the kids. We got stuck in that narrative. Instead of saying, how do we really look at our workforce and say that most families where there are, you know, a dad and a mom or two people heading the household, most families are now dual income. So we haven't recognized what's actually happening, whereas the European nations have recognized that, so they put in paid family medical leave. And so until we recognize that, 
then we can't actually change it. I do think part of it is that we have an older Congress and we have a Congress that, you know, hasn't been very representative and very young and inclusive of lots of different uh, gender types and, and race. And so they got stuck in this old narrative and saying, instead of saying, this is what's actually happening. Now mm -hmm. let's address it. And we know if you have the right paid family medical leave policy, what happens then is dads want to stay home for a time. And guess what? They then actually care for the kids more over the whole course of the kid's life. So like when I go to Sweden and you talk to dads, they're appalled at the US. They say, are you kidding me? I want to have some time to stay home with my young child and get to know him or her and then go back to work. And I want my, that for my wife too. And so we're giving up something that we actually care deeply about, which is caring for our children and caring for our parents. That's part of being a human being and we shouldn't do that anymore. And how do, how do we get my generation to under, understand this fully? I mean, my mom talks so much about this and I know that it's growing and growing how many of the younger generation is having to take care of their parents and their grandparents and having to work more and more, but yet it doesn't seem like a hot topic to a lot of people my age. So how, how do we draw them in to understand uh, what you're really talking about. Yeah, I'm so encouraged by your generation. I have lots of nieces and nephews who are essentially around the same age, I think, as you, Patrick. Yeah. And what I'm seeing in their homes is they actually are having this conversation. When they okay. get married or before they get married, they're talking about who's going to do what? How are we going to make this work? What are some things that we can bring in to, the, to make this work better in our, in our home? So I'm encouraged by your generation. I also think of your generation as being the ones with the great new ideas. And so we can invest as investors, we should invest in entrepreneurs. I just recently was talking with a couple of them last week who we've been investing in for a little while, this company I have called Pivotal Ventures. One of them is connecting seniors to college age students. It's a great job for college age student to go pick up prescriptions, go pick up groceries wow. for a senior, um, connect with them online, either via phone or FaceTime or whatever, so that we help with the isolation um, there's another one get started by a young mom who is about all about how do you connect families to high quality childcare options in their community right now, which places are still open, which places are doing the right safety practices and which ones are high quality. So you can literally go online. So I think we need to move money to entrepreneurs who have great ideas around this and we just haven't invested in it. Yeah, so that, I was going to ask you, Melinda, how do you think technology can play a role in addressing this issue that perhaps wasn't even part of the conversation five years ago, 10 years ago? Yeah, we can look at this as a marketplace. So $4 trillion is what caregiving is. It's a $4 trillion market. So if we start to move money, I know, I've met young people that have great ideas around this, even monitoring devices so their parents can stay in their homes and they can monitor their parents from afar, their heart rate, or if they take a fall, they know it immediately. It goes out to several people's numbers so that they can, they can address it. So we, gotta, we have to invest and bring these ideas forward because you know, I think about the seniors right now and, the one, and most of them would like to stay in their home as long as they possibly can. It's good for them, but nobody wants to be isolated, right? So right. if we can do things to break that cycle of isolation, and I think it's the young people that have the good ideas around that because many of them have grandparents that they love and care about. No, 100%. I think that it's so interesting to me that your, your venture is called Pivotal Ventures. And I think that right now, so many young entrepreneurs are, are, this is the first time really going through a crisis like this, right? And they're having to really pivot. So what, what kind of advice would you give to these young, entre young entrepreneurs? I mean, there's so many opportunities. It's hard to see right now, but like you're saying, of connecting the caregivers, looking at this as a, a time to create those businesses. Yeah, I would say keep pushing forward. I would say um, there are places like Techstars that help with accelerators for teaching you how to start a business, how to find investors, how to look at these as marketplaces, which I think your generation actually sees. And I think having young um, entrepreneurs understand that these can be businesses, even though we've never seen them before, you right. are the ones that can look forward and see them and go, yes, there's an opportunity there. And guess what? Many, many, many people care about this.
Yeah, because Patrick moved home together with me during this crisis because he was, quote, the only one in the family who had come home and, quote, take care of me because I was in this vulnerable population that I never thought I was vulnerable, right? But I think, you know, kind of this whole conversation now about who's vulnerable, who's not, what is aging, what are the responsibilities in a family? And I think also, doesn't the conversation have to shift from what is a family's responsibility to what is also a nation's responsibility? What is our collective responsibility for our larger family? Definitely. And it's why we need a paid family medical leave policy at the national level. We've got it in about eight states. Yeah. We need a national policy on this. And the other thing we can do is we can put pressure on businesses. I mean, one of the things I see Patrick's generation doing is when they take jobs, they're saying to their employees, we care about these issues. I want to have children one day. So you know, what are your policies? Am I going to have um, credits for good child care support? Am I going to have flexible hours? I think you're starting to see employees need more flexibility. We can create that at home. Some are saying, do you have on-site child care? And so I think we can all use our voices to push on this and say this is important, both from a policy perspective, a business perspective, and an investment so we can create the future that we want. Um, we're all part Absolutely. of creating this nation, and uh, it, it, we can do that. Absolutely, because certainly when I went into the workforce, I'm a little bit older than you, but you never would have asked for childcare credits. You never would have asked uh, about a maternity policy or family leave policy. You were just lucky to get a job, right? So the conversation is completely different, and it was just assumed that when you had a kid, you'd kind of drop down and you'd go take care of it. It wasn't even a conversation that you'd have with your prospective spouse about are they, where are they gonna share? So the entire conversation has shifted. And that's something, as you said, that young people are talking about in a very different way, your generation. Right, and speaking of the young generation, you and your husband just wrote um, a commencement speech for a bunch of these graduates. And unfortunately, a lot of them can't, or actually probably all of them won't have a a formal graduation, our brother, or mm -hmm. well, my brother, her son, <laughs> uh, Christopher just had a Zoom graduation. And, and so what are you telling all these new graduates that thought they were going into a bull market, one of the best job, um, you know, eras ever, and, and now they're going into, you know, graduating right into the epicenter of this, of this, uh, you know, crisis. crisis. Yeah, my heart goes out to seniors graduating right now. It's hard to not have that moment of celebration because they've worked so hard to get to that place. Their families have worked hard to get to that, to that place of graduation. But what I want to say to all college graduates, if you have graduated from college, you're lucky. You're lucky. I mean, you have skills that you can use and you can give back and you will find a job. It's, it's very different than somebody that only has a high school degree or doesn't even have a high school degree. I mean, we're seeing these unemployment numbers rise. Those are the families that are struggling to put meals on the table. And they're the ones that retooling is not as easy. So if you have a college degree, what I wanna to say to you is there will still be opportunities and think about not just that job, but think about how you're gonna change the nation and think about how you're gonna help the most vulnerable who we're all gonna be affected by this. Let's be honest, the next decade ahead looks different. But how do you use your skills, not just in your employment opportunity, but to change and create the world that you want us to live in that supports everybody in this nation? Melinda, you and your husband have given, I think it's close to $300 million in the last couple of months to fight COVID. And I think your husband said, you know, kind of, we're not going to, until we get a vaccine, we're not going to really be fully open. How far out do you think that is? I think it's 12 to 18 months. Um, and I think that, you know, it, these things take time. You have to go through all of those safety and efficacy trials to know that what we're putting in our body isn't going to create more harm. Um, some of those places can be sped up a bit. And believe me, everybody's doing that and looking at it. But, you know, these things take time. So I think in the meantime, we have to talk about, okay, what tools do we have? Testing, contact tracing, social isolation, masks. We have to keep doing all the right things so that slowly we can reopen parts of the economy, but do it in a very safe um, way. Are you hopeful? Uh, you know, most people I talk to talk about feeling a little bit hopeless helpless, scared, anxious for themselves, for their children. 
I'm wondering if you are hopeful, hopeful that we might get a family leave policy, hopeful for these young kids that Patrick represents, hopeful for women like myself and like you and so many other millions who are out there uh, looking for a different country. Are you hopeful now or do you feel like, I don't know. I'm hopeful because I see people using their voices and I see people speaking up for the right things. And I see world leaders in other places doing the right things like Chancellor Merkel. I mean, you're seeing Germany may be one of the ones that comes out of this in a slow way, but first and rebuilds their economy. And um, so I'm hopeful. You know, I believe in human ingenuity. I believe in the human spirit and we've seen some of the best. I mean, when you see people coming out and cheering for healthcare workers and you're seeing people, you know, Seattle was one of the epicenters at the beginning. It was blank. We live in a place where I can see a bridge. People weren't even going across, we're not going across the bridge. They were staying home. So when I think about rebuilding after World War II, that's what I think this is going to look like. And again, you look at that human ingenuity and that human spirit to rebuild our communities, to rebuild our world, to say, what new institutions do we need to keep us safe? I believe that we will do that. And I believe it's going to be the leaders who already have those positions and voters holding them to task. And I believe it's going to be Patrick's generation that helps us with this rebuilding and reimagining what our economy can look like and what our world can look like. So for all the people that are, are listening right now and will continue to listen throughout the rest of the day you or can days. You read that op-ed in the Washington yes. Post. Yes. How, how, can, how can people contribute? What, what is there, you know, is there going to your guys' website? Is it going to the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Is it, um, what can people do to, to join your, your fight? It is, in terms of caregiving, it's reaching out to your senator, to your congressperson, writing them, writing their office. It's the business, if you're part of, if you have an employer saying what you expect, and it's using your voice in this election, as we run up to this election to say, what do we expect from American leaders? What, what's going well and what's not going well? And let's hold our leaders to task and say, we wanna rebuild something different than we have right now. Our system is not serving us well. And so how do we rebuild? And so I would encourage everybody to use their voice in this. And then at home, I would say, if you have a partner or spouse that you're living with, think about in your own home, having that conversation about who's doing what and how do we wanna reimagine the housework and the care that's happening right now in our home while we try and work. And all, all great ideas, great companies come out of a need. So often it was a personal thing. Like I went to try to find something from my parents. It wasn't there. I created this. I needed caregiving. It wasn't there. Therefore, I created this. So using technology uh, to advance bold ideas, reaching out to venture people like yourself to invest in those ideas and, and kind of encouraging young people to think around this area that perhaps you hadn't thought about before, right? Definitely. And saying to limited partners, invest in these new areas. You might not have been able to imagine caregiving before, but it is front and center. You can't miss it. It's probably in your own home right now. And so, hey, think about investing in this new area that you've never invested in before, because we have to move money out to entrepreneurs to create these businesses. Melinda Gates, thank you so much. Her op-ed is called How Rethinking Caregiving Could Play a Crucial Role in Restarting the Economy. It's in the Washington Post today. You can read it online. As she said, use your voice to get in touch with your local leaders. I think we've seen how important government is uh, in this uh, pandemic, in this crisis. People who thought perhaps they didn't need government are now seeing the importance of local leadership, statewide leadership, and uh, what happens at the national level is worth voting for. So Melinda, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on the op-ed. Keep up thank the good you. work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Patrick. Have a good day. Yeah, you, you too. too. Bye. Bye-bye. So I think that that's uh, encouraging to, I, I thought it was very encouraging that young people uh, like yourself might change our future. I hope so. I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. But I thought it was no, encouraging. I think it, it, it is. And, and especially from her, the venture side, because so many of the conversations that we've been having with people are, uh, have been business leaders and have been talking about mm -hmm. how you really have to utilize right now to search for the opportunity that it's really hard during, during down times and tough times to think of country in the world on the other side of it. Yeah, but just like she had said, there, there are a lot of opportunities in this healthcare 
industry in that uh, you know caregiving in uh, the paid sick leave and, and all that and there's there's businesses to be made and she was talking about how she's investing in some and and looking for young entrepreneurs that are gonna uh, go out and kind of create that out of the opportunity and and um, so I, I thought it was very helpful and, and interesting well that yeah in your generation you'll be going and talking about uh, what are your flexible hours what is your uh, you know healthcare policy, all these questions that my generation could never ask. So um, you have some issues impacting you in a negative way that my generation didn't, but you also have so many opportunities that previous generation didn't have. So that's the good news. Uh, once again, the op-ed is about caregiving. Um, if you have a venture, hit her up at Pivotal <laughs> Ventures and uh, see if she uh, funds your venture in this space of caregiving, family leave, connecting young people to seniors, and so on. So I uh, want to thank you all for joining us on Home Together today. We love being home together. Uh, for many of you, your state is beginning to open, reopen. So go forth uh, by guarding your health, wear a mask, uh, continue to wash your hands. And for those of you who are still at home together, uh, we'll still be here. Uh, we're doing our part, uh, waiting for our governor to tell us whether we can go back out. Yeah, tomorrow they start phase one. Phase one um, here in California. And, uh, you know, opening some florists, shops, and uh, sporting goods and but places. No, no hairdressers. No yet. hairdressers. No hairdressers no, as yet. As you can so tell with my hair. Is I'm the... going to be Rapunzel by the time this is over. <laughs> so... Anyway, we want to thank you so much. Thank Melinda Gates. And you have a great day wherever you are. And I will be on the Women's Alzheimer's Movement channel later this afternoon, 3 o'clock West Coast time, talking to Dan Butner, the author of The Blue Zones, uh, cookbook challenge, Blue Zones, uh, uh, finding the Blue Zones. So if you're interested in how to live to 100, how to be healthy wow. until 100, how to live I on am. your own. Uh, please go over to the Women's Alzheimer's Movement at 3 o'clock. It's called WHAM. And I'll be talking with the Blue Zones' Dan Butner. And his book is extraordinary, and all his information is extraordinary. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm Patrick Schwarzenegger. And I'm Maria Schreiber. And that was another Home Together. And we will see you all tomorrow. Have Bye. a great day.